So here I'm going to use some really basic principles of microeconomics issues to discuss a couple of key environmental economics issues, right? So I'm going to do some really basic stuff, just generally speaking, just basic of first couple of week of principles level. I use this in my principles microeconomics class as well as my international economics class. But basically, I'm going to take this core economic concept and explain pollution abatement and then a little bit about cap and trade and, and pollution permits and stuff like that, right? So. I'm going to use the basic cost and benefit graph. I use I talk about this elsewhere and derive it. Generally speaking, economics is about diminishing returns. And so the more you do of something, the more it costs. So marginal cost is generally rising. And the more you do of something, the less you benefit from it. So marginal benefit is falling. And that can be applied to everything. I talk about, for example, the labor market, where if I were to have a lot, an increasing number of employees um, adding labor, eventually I'd run out of equipment for them to work on. I could have a coffee shop with only a couple cash registers and only a couple coffee machines, and eventually the workers that I do add aren't able to really work for me because there's nowhere to work, so marginal benefit falls. And then you can look at that the same way and say, well, if I'm adding more and more workers and I'm paying them to do less and less, you can say that they're costing me more and more because if I look at what little work I get, I'm paying them the same, they're going to actually cost me more per item produced, right? So this is based on diminishing returns, and I talk about it elsewhere. Now, one thing that we talk about is this point being the best point to be at. It's optimal, and we're going to get the optimal quantity, because if you do more than that, then the costs exceed the benefits, and if you do less, then the benefits exceed the costs, and you kind of lose out by not doing more, right? So I'm going to use this simple graph. Again, I use it the first week of, uh, maybe the first, second week of uh, principles. And then we can use it to just, uh, apply it to some micro issues, right? So optimal quantity is where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost, right? Again, <clears throat> if I've got Q2 and Q1 here. At Q2, marginal cost is greater than marginal benefit, right? So we all know not to do something that costs more than it's worth. So this, at this point, we've, we're adding one more unit. The cost is higher than the benefit. And so it's just obviously a no-brainer, right? I would not... Uh, I wouldn't spend six dollars to do something that uh, is worth four dollars, for example. Right, so don't do anything where the cost exceeds the benefit. Now, there's also a welfare loss here if at Q1 where it's too low. So Q1 is less than the optimal quantity. The benefit is actually greater than the cost, or the cost is less than the benefit. So you're, you're losing out if you don't do more, because this is something where it's worth more than you're paying. If you don't do it, you're actually losing out on all the gains you could get from doing it. Right, so this is the optimal quantity here. Right? So if you know um, welfare analysis and micro, you can graph a concept similar to deadweight loss. It's also a triangle. My triangles are not exactly perfect, but they do line up here. And so this is the total cost from exceeding the optimal quantity. So every point here is where the cost exceeds the benefit. And so for every unit, you're adding up all these costs, and they're going to sum up, in this case, to a triangle. Okay, This is the lost benefit, and it's also a triangle. So at this quantity, Q1, I'm giving up all these benefits, right? Benefits are up here, and I'm giving them all up. But that continues on until I reach the optimal point. So this is how you can actually represent the welfare loss from doing too little or too much of something. Okay, So knowing that, we can apply to a pollution abatement. Right? So abatement is when you get rid of harmful substances. It could be the government doing it. It could be you. Right? One thing people could talk about is lead paint, uh, you know, lead pipes. There's like nitrous oxides and different uh, chemical compounds that you could have, you know, sulfur and stuff, uh, all sorts of uh, various harmful substances in the air and in the water and so forth. All right, one example I always think about is lead. A lot of times people rent an apartment and they just say, watch out for lead. They hand you a bro brochure and there could be lead paint somewhere, there could be lead pipes, but nobody actually pays to get rid of it. All right, they just say, watch out. Children have to watch out for eating you know, paint and stuff. They put stuff in their mouths, but uh, it's costly to remove the lead. So if we talk about the costs and benefits of removing the substances, that's the cost and benefits from abatement, right? And so. You can imagine that the, if you have uh, you know, some sort of project where you're getting rid of lead in a house, uh, you're going to get the easy stuff first, right? You're going to scrape the easy paint and so forth, but eventually you're climbing up a ladder, getting some inside of a chimney or something that is actually harder to get. Right? Costs are going to go up as you're getting the harder to reach stuff. At the same time, do you really need to remove the lead that's buried underneath a basement floor? And maybe not. So you get the, the most beneficial stuff first, right? The stuff that everybody grabs, the stuff that people touch, but eventually you're going to be pay, you know, paying a lot lot of money to, to 
eliminate some lead or something else that nobody's actually going to ever notice, right? And so that comes into all sorts of uh, decisions, um, right? That, that the some amount of lead is actually tolerated, some amount of asbestos, some amount of uh, pollution is tolerated because there's a cost-benefit decision to removing it, right? Now, is this a good quantity? You know, that's debatable, but people can't really afford to uh, get rid of every drop of pollution because there's a cost involved. And again, if you're paying for it, some pollution is just not worth getting rid of. Now the government could, uh, for example, lower the cost. So this is just a simple uh, graph you know, shift. Lowering the cost means bringing the cost down, maybe giving people a subsidy, giving them some sort of a credit that will lower the cost. And if you notice here, the red line here, the new cost-benefit decision is at a larger quantity, right? So we're just using cost-benefit analysis to show that increased, uh, excuse me, lowered costs can lead to more pollution abatement. So the government does have a large number of incentives to lower people's costs. Um, you do the same thing, they can increase the benefits same way, right? So you could use policy to promote abatement. Right. So that's the cost and benefit. The optimal quantity is actually not zero. Some amount is tolerated, keeping that in mind, but policy can be used to increase the quantity of, of good things like pollution abatement. Right? Now, here's where you can involve some sort of a, what I call you know, kind of a cap and trade. It's not the cap and trade from environmental yet, but it's the same idea where um, you can have people trading something of value to reach an optimal solution. Okay, so here I'm assuming that people are, there's two companies and they're going to clean up 200 units of pollution, right? So I made this up, but the idea is that you want 200 units cleaned up in the most efficient way, okay? Now, here there's two firms with different costs. There's the high cost firm, right? The costs are literally higher, and that's, remember, this activity is not production, it's actually the, uh, it's production of cleaning, or it's the abatement process. This is the costly firm, this is the low cost firm. All right, the marginal benefits the same for both because it's for society, right? Get the high benefit stuff first, then move to the low benefit stuff, all right? Now, there's two ways to do it. You could split this 200 two ways. Each firm does exactly 100, or you could find a way to use the market where the low cost firm does more of the 200. They do a larger share than the other, all right? And there's going to be a way to have economics use it. And we're going to see that doing a one size fits all policy, at both do 100, is less efficient than finding a way to uh, split it up more uh, efficiently, all right? So, we know marginal cost equals marginal benefit, and that's the efficient point, but here there are actually two points, and it would be probably better if the mar high cost firm did less, so they did 50 of the 200, and the low cost, remember it's easier for them, they do 150, okay? We can compare that to each doing 100, right, so this would actually be, you know, applied to both. We would see that the high cost firm would be too much, and the low cost firm would be too little. You can use those triangles to draw the losses, right, so this is all the losses from the high cost firm doing too much of a costly activity. All right, this is the losses from the low cost from doing not enough of a low cost activity. All right, so this is kind of like the deadweight loss. This line here involves losses to society. Right, so you could apply that to cap, cap and trade. Here we're capping the kind of like the assignment to abate or to reduce pollution. Um, the, I'm setting the cap at Q, but somehow this high cost firm, knowing that they're incurring losses, could find a way to transfer money to the low cost firm to do more. They would like to get the money because again, they're, they're sort of profiting by doing it, right? If it's low cost, they can collect something in between where this company can pay something less than its high costs and then it will actually be cheaper to pay someone else to do it than to pay the high cost themselves. This company could collect that money and then do something that's low cost and kind of keep the rest as a profit. Right? They can negotiate and find a price that's mutually beneficial because it's between the two costs. Right? Anywhere in between the two would work. You could almost say that, that this middle point would reach something good as well. All right? But it does not have to be exactly in the middle. All right? And so they can trade the, the uh, in this case, it's an assignment, but you could also have the rights to do something where trading abatement, but you could also apply to the right to pollute, and that's what the cap and trade does, that uh, people need to use carbon, but they can trade to different companies that use different amounts of carbon, and then they can uh, can they can they use more carbon or, or emit more carbon than their allotment, right? Now, if we go from this inefficient one-size-fits-all policy to over here and here, these disappear. So here's the 50 that the, the high-cost firm does, here's the 150 that the low-cost firm does, right? And so there's no losses, and so this is actually more efficient than the others.
right? So that's what I did. I have cost-benefit analysis using the basic economic concept that the efficient point is that where costs equal benefits and doing more or less is less efficient. I just showed how abatement reaches an optimal quantity that's higher than zero. But then uh, you kind of have two cost firms and show that they might have different optimal solutions. And rather than the government trying to figure out which, you know, how, why it's 50 and not 55, they can actually use the market to negotiate something that's actually best for all of them.